All right, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Sunday Night Edition. It's my great pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Danica Morelli uh, as our feature presenter tonight. She received her Doctor of Optometry degree from University of Houston's College of Optometry, and she completed a residency in hospital-based optometry at the Baltimore VA Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland. She's currently a clinical professor at Houston's College of Optometry, where she is an assistant dean of clinical education, and she staffs the glaucoma, retina, and general eye disease clinics. In the classroom, she teaches ocular pharmacology, glaucoma, and case-based learning courses. She became a diplomate in ocular disease subset glaucoma of the, in the American Academy of Optometry in 2009, and she's currently vice president of the Optometric Glaucoma Society. I've shared the podium several times with Dr. Morelli. It's always been uh, an honor for me to do that. It's always been a learning experience for me to do that. I'm very happy to, uh, to be involved uh, any, in anything that she does. So please give a virtual welcome to Dr. Danica Morelli. Thank you, Dr. Selka. I uh, should say the same thing about you. It was uh, such a pleasure and an honor to be invited to um, speak in this um, optometric CE program. I always like to start with my financial disclosures because in this particular case, I have a financial disclosure that I, I think is important. You can see them on the screen, but Carl Zeiss Meditech is the maker of the Cirrus OCT. That's the OCT that I personally have in my clinic at the University of Houston. And I have been a consultant and a speaker for Carl Zeiss Meditech. That being said, I don't have any interest in, in getting you to buy a Cirrus. I have no financial um, interest in the company. And um, I'm a firm believer when it comes to OCT that you should love the one you're with. And by that, I mean, all of these instruments are really great. And I think the trick is learning everything you can about your individual instrument. So um, get with your reps, you know, go onto the websites and learn everything that you can about the, um, about the instrument that you have. So let's go ahead and get started. I like to just kind of get a feel for the audience through a couple of very, very quick cases. So I call these, is this glaucoma? This is Dennis, case number one, 65 year old white male who got referred to me for a glaucoma evaluation. His ocular history is unremarkable. He's got a pretty typical uh, medical history of diabetes and hypertension, both of which are well controlled, no family history of glaucoma. His exam is going well. He's got 20-25 vision due to a little cataract change in the right eye, 20 20 in the left. Pupils are normal. All the entry tests are normal. Slit lamp exam is normal. Intraocular pressure is 31 in the right eye, 30 in the left eye. Here are Dennis's optic nerves. Here are Dennis's visual fields. And my question is, is this glaucoma? So if we can launch the first question, Yes, this is glaucoma. No, this is not. Or I need additional information. And Danica, I'm not sure on your end as that presenter, the, the, they're rolling in nicely, the results. Yeah, I can't see that, but that's okay. You, you guys surprise me when it's time. All right. <laughs> Everybody's very quick. Okay. Oop. I want to go back. Do we have the uh, poll results? Yeah, they come in. It just takes a little time. We like to oh, okay. a certain okay. percentage. Yeah, they'll come to a certain percentage just to make it live and interactive so we can meet that compliance with COPE. That's fine. You know, I was thinking as we, as we wait for these poll answers to come in, I was literally thinking, I have been doing nothing but Zoom for the past, what, 19 months? And, you know, get on tonight and have a big major technical, you know, challenge. It's, uh, it's always something, isn't it? I'm glad we could provide that service for you. <laughs> All right, we'll end the poll. I think we got the trend here, what's going on. We got a nice percentage of people and 6% have said, yes, it's glaucoma. We've got 11% saying no. And you can see the majority at 83% that are saying they need more information. 
Yeah, no, you know, I get that a lot. I, when I give this live, I try to get uh, the audience to be engaged and I hear a lot of different things that people want. And the things that I typically hear are pachymetry, which I think is important, but I don't think is going to tell us if this patient has glaucoma. Uh, and then of course, you know, it's a lecture on OCT. So a lot of people say they want an OCT. Let's go to case number two. This is Maria. Maria is a 45 year old Hispanic female who was also referred to me for a glaucoma evaluation. Her ocular and medical history are unremarkable. She doesn't really know very much about her family. Most of them live in Mexico. Um, she, her vision is 20-20 in each eye. Her pupils are normal. All of her findings are normal, including slit lamp and gonioscopy. Her intraocular pressures are 24 in the right and 23 in the left. Here are Maria's optic nerves. and Maria's visual fields. We're gonna launch the same poll. Does Maria have glaucoma? So we'll wait a little bit as um, the answers come in. I know probably some people are watching a little football while this is going on. Um, my team won today, the terrible Texans, they won. Um, so we'll wait for some I don't know why this is advancing because I'm not advancing this. It's part of those technical difficulties that we're trying to <laughs> deliver for you. <laughs> oh my gosh. We've only got an hour and 40 minutes here. Joe, if you're doing things on your end, that might be doing it because you're maybe it's trying to do polls and stuff yeah. and click. And so mm -hmm. I'm trying to do as much as I can here for you. Better. All right, I'm going to end this poll. We're about 90%. That's where we like to have it. And I think, you know, you know, this one's a little bit more uh, swayed in the yeses. We got 72% saying yes, and we got 3% saying no. And we only have 25 on this one saying they need more information. Yeah, that's interesting. Oops. I didn't um, share the results here again. Let me that's share. Okay. And I, and I think that's, I think that is um, sort of to be expected. Um, I would argue that we can say yes or no in both of these cases without any additional information. And um, the reason I say that is because really when we're looking for glaucoma, we're looking for those characteristic optic nerve changes. If we see those characteristic optic nerve changes, um, I'm not doing this to my screen, so um, I'm just gonna try to go back. There we go. If we see those characteristic optic nerve changes, typically the answer is yes. And if we don't see those characteristic nerve or nerve fiber layer changes, typically the answer is no. And I think that is where we're changing because OCT can help us maybe get to that diagnosis a little bit earlier. But I think our first pass at the question, does this patient have glaucoma? has to be a look at the nerve. And so uh, we'll come back to Dennis and Maria in just a minute, but a couple of things I wanna just kind of set the framework as we get started. Uh, glaucoma is a disease of retinal ganglion cells. I say it all the time that it's a chronic progressive optic neuropathy, but truthfully, it's a disease of retinal ganglion cells. Uh, damage to the ganglion cell axons occurs at the lamina cribrosa and selectively damages the superior and inferior portions of the optic nerve. Uh, one of the hallmarks, and I'm going to go back, I'm probably say the word asymmetry, you know, 10 times during the next two hours. Uh, but I think that asymmetry is really a hallmark of glaucoma. And that means asymmetry between right and left eye, and also asymmetry between top and bottom, top and bottom of the nerve, top and bottom of the visual field. The characteristic changes that we see are a large CD ratio for the size of the optic nerve. You really need to know what the size of the nerve is in order to judge whether or not that CD ratio seems normal to you. We look for focal or diffuse rim thinning, focal or diffuse nerve fiber layer loss, and we use the OCT a lot for that, but we can also see that clinically, optic disc hemorrhage and peripapillary atrophy. And so if we go back to Dennis, and remember, uh, Dennis has pressures, intraocular pressures of 31 and 30, but when we look at these optic nerves, there are none of the characteristic changes. He's got an average size disc with an average size cup. He doesn't have any focal thinning. He doesn't have a disc hemorrhage. He doesn't have peripapillary atrophy. He does have myopic crescents, uh, and he doesn't have um, nerve fiber layer loss. Uh, he does have the single biggest risk factor for developing glaucoma. And so 
I ended up treating Dennis because his corneas were not very thick. And so I did end up treating him, but I didn't and I don't think that he has glaucoma. If we look at Maria, on the other hand, I actually call her my poster child. She has pretty much every single thing that you can have um, that's a sign of glaucoma. So she has sort of average size disc with a very large vertical cup. She has focal rim thinning inferiorly in both eyes. She has nerve fiber layer loss, slit defects in both eyes superiorly, and really complete loss, not even a wedge. I mean, just complete loss of the nerve fiber layer inferiorly. She has peripapillary atrophy temporally and inferiorly in each eye. And she has a little tiny disc hemorrhage on that left optic nerve. So she kind of has everything that you could possibly want to make a diagnosis of glaucoma. And frankly, it doesn't matter if her pressures are 23 or 16, she's got the G. I always like to come back to her visual field because sometimes people get a little freaked out by this left visual field. Um, by the way, uh, Greg, can you see my pointer when I'm moving it on the screen? The answer is yes. You okay, can good. See it. I, yep. I, I'm just pointing away and I was hoping y'all could see it. Yep, we can. Um, yep. So some people look at this grayscale of this left eye and say, oh gosh, that must be some kind of post-chiasmal quadrant defect or something like that. Just remember that the grayscale is great for pointing out the areas that need further investigation, but it's not a great tool for making a diagnosis. So when we come down to our deviation plots, we can see that this deep defect goes well past the vertical midline. So these are characteristic uh, visual field defects as well. So, you know, I, I think without an OCT, you can easily say that Dennis doesn't have glaucoma and very easily say that Maria does. So evaluation of the nerve fiber layer, you know, I kind of cut my teeth on this. My residency director was really big on looking at the nerve fiber layer clinically. It was a long, long time before we had OCTs. Uh, and the reason that it's so important to look at the nerve fiber layer is that we know from work that Harry Quigley and others did that you can lose a lot of nerve fiber layer before you end up with a visual field defect. And you can see those changes sometimes clinically. Um, looking at the nerve fiber layer can help us differentiate just physiological logic cupping. So this is a large CD ratio, but it's normal versus pathologic cupping in glaucoma. We know that the nerve fiber layer is thickest and brightest in the superior and inferior arcades, uh, thinner in the papillomacular bundle. And we really can't even see the nerve fiber layer on the nasal side. It's just so spread out. And that results in this bright, dimmer, bright pattern. So it's really easy when somebody draws it for you and says, this is how it's supposed to look. But you know, as these ganglion cells are sending their axons in to insert in the superior and inferior poles of the nerve, those nerve fiber bundles are just stacking up on one another. And so they will reflect that red free light um, at more where the nerve fiber layer is thicker. So we get this bright, dim, bright pattern. And I will admit that I am, I've gotten kind of lazy about doing it clinically at the slit lamp with my 78 diopter lens, but you can also do it really well with today's um, digital camera systems. And so this is how you would see, uh, you know, using a red free filter, the bright, dim, bright pattern of a normal nerve fiber layer. Now we can have two kinds of nerve fiber layer dropout. Diffuse loss is more common. It's harder to see. So that's kind of a bummer. Uh, but you can see in these two images, this is from a, a textbook that's no longer in print. You can see in this image on the left that you can see the brightness of the superior nerve fiber layer. You don't really see that down here. So this patient has diffuse inferior nerve fiber layer loss and the opposite on this image on the right. So we see the bright striations down below. This patient is just missing that brightness in the superior arcade. It's less common, but a lot easier to see the focal loss, which are the slits and the wedges. And so again, usually a red free filter will help us see that, but you saw in Maria's pictures that sometimes you can just see it uh, on a standard color image. And when you have a slit defect, you won't necessarily have a visual field defect because that represents a relatively small area of dropout in the nerve fiber layer. And we have a lot of redundancy um, in our visual field. So that might not show up as a visual field loss, but when that slit turns into a wedge, so it expands uh, into a wedge, we see it in a drawing in a red free photograph. And then I think you can see it in this photo um, on the right-hand side in just a color photo, these wedges will almost always be associated with notching of the neuroretinal rim. So it's just so thin that there's almost no rim left at all. 
And these will absolutely always have a visual field defect that corresponds with them. And so if we go again back to Maria, you can easily see the large defect below and the smaller defect superiorly. Of course, when I say nerve fiber layer, I almost don't even think about those images that I just showed you. I pretty much think of something like this, some kind of automated nerve fiber layer imaging. And, you know, I used the GDX. It was a, it was a one horse pony, but it's pretty good pony. It gave us some uh, birefringent patterns and allowed us to look at the nerve fiber layer. So if you still have one of these, it's not a bad tool. You just can't get it serviced. Um, and certainly we think of our OCTs, our current day spectral domain OCTs as being really valuable in helping us not just you know, say, oh, that looks like there's a defect there, but to actually quantify the defect and follow the patient over time. If we look at imaging and glaucoma detection, I have here optic nerve and nerve fiber layer photography kind of separated out from our automated instruments. It's really an enduring, uh, it's old fashioned technology, I guess you would say, um, but it's really valuable. And if you're not taking high quality images photographs of your patients uh, that you think may have glaucoma or who are kind of in this glaucoma spectrum of a suspect or frank glaucoma. If you're not taking photos of them, I encourage you to do it. It gets a little tricky with billing because you can't bill for it on the same day as an OCT. Um, but I've never taken a photograph of a glaucoma suspect and five years later kicked myself for it. I have kicked myself for not getting a photograph of a patient that I think is a glaucoma suspect. So I'm gonna leave that alone. I'm gonna encourage you to continue or start taking high quality photographs, particularly red free, but even just high quality optic nerve photos. But then we got into our automated imaging instruments. So scanning laser off thermoscopy, you know, was a, a great step forward, but we're really not using that anymore. Polarimetry, like I talked about, has kind of gone by the wayside. And even within OCT, we have our old time domain. And I can remember the first time I saw a time domain OCT, and I thought it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And then spectral domain comes out, I don't know how many years later, and we throw time domain, time domain out like it's, you know, something horrible. Uh, and now there are even, you know, better technologies than our, our spectral domain. We have swept source and different things like that. So, you know, we've had a lot of changes in OCT. One thing I think is really good now is that as the technology is changing, I think more of the instrument companies are getting better about having them be backward compatible. So for example, you can't compare a spectral domain to a time domain OCT. They're just too different. But as changes and improvements have come in the spectral domain realm, we can often back, um, you know, we can be backward compatible with earlier technology. So how good is OCT at diagnosing glaucoma? Well, I would start by saying that instruments don't diagnose, doctors diagnose, but the diagnostic capability of an OCT is really excellent for moderate to severe glaucoma. But the truth is you and I should be really excellent for moderate to severe glaucoma. And where we really want our OCT to help us on the diagnostic side is really in those early glaucoma patients. And it's good, but it's not perfect. It's certainly improved when more than one parameter in, is involved. And so we're gonna get into some of the printouts and look at things, high, high yield areas to look on the printout. I remember that with the old GDX, there was the number and it was this number and nobody knew what it meant exactly. But if it was zero to 30, it was normal. If it was 30 to 50, it was borderline. And if it was worse than 50, it was bad. Um, but that's one number and what does it mean? You know, If you put all your eggs in one basket, you're gonna have a problem. So the more things that we look at, the better our diagnostic capabilities are gonna be. And I think a lot of us, myself included, have come to rely on OCT in the diagnosis and management watching for progression of glaucoma. But sometimes I sit back and I, I watch my students and my frame of reference is always my students, it's who I work with. And I worry a little bit that they think that the OCT is the answer. I know we're busy, we're, we have patients in the waiting room, we're trying to make good decisions, we want it to be as easy as possible. But the truth is that when your OCT ships, it doesn't come with a brain. And so an OCT is really just like a laboratory test, right? You might order a laboratory test, but you have to interpret what it means. And the same thing, these instruments are really powerful. They give us really amazing information, 
but we still have to use our doctor brains uh, and figure out what that information means and try not to be led astray. So looking at uh, you know just some of the articles that have been published on the diagnostic capability, this was a Cochrane database review, and they looked at GDX out of date, HRT out of date, and this was time domain OCT, and they estimated from all the studies that they read and pooled the data that if you had a thousand people referred for a glaucoma evaluation and 200 of those patients had glaucoma, you would incorrectly identify 50 of the 800 normals as having glaucoma, and you would miss about 60 of the 200 people who did have glaucoma. So while they're very good, there is going to be some overdiagnosis and some underdiagnosis or, uh, you know, when we're using these instruments. They're not perfect, in other words. Uh, they are good, um, and they've gotten better. I'm going to get back to this article here. Michael Sullivan Me uh, is an optometrist who used to be the chief at the um, Albuquerque VA Hospital, and he wrote a paper about early diagnosis. What are the things that we should be looking for on our OCT in early glaucoma, because most of the studies are actually on more moderate to severe glaucoma. And I'll get back to that uh, in a little bit, but even there you can see they don't have perfect sensitivity and specificity. Now, I'm not saying that OCTs aren't good. This is a, a study that looked at 75 eyes of 75 glaucoma suspects without visual field defects, uh, compared them to healthy controls, and they could see a significant difference just in the average RNFL thickness on an OCT up to eight years before those glaucoma suspects developed visual field. So kind of similar to what Harry Quigley had said back in the late 1980s. So what information do these instruments give us? Now, all of the instruments give slightly different information, but there's kind of a, they're kind of, you could group it into um, some categories that most of the instruments will have. So one thing that can tell us is about optic nerve parameters. How big is the disc? I said earlier that your CD ratio is only important if you know what the size of your disc is. So I have a great big optic disc. I expect to have a great big optic cup and that may be normal. If I have a more small disc, I expect that cup to be very small. And so knowing the disc size can be helpful. They can give us information information like the rim area or the rim or cup volume. Um, I use disc size on my OCT often. I don't use these other uh, quite as much, but I'll, I'll look at them. Obviously, we look at them for retinal nerve fiber layer parameters, so average thickness, quadrant thickness, uh, looking at the T-SNT curve, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and then we're starting to look obviously at macular thickness as well in our glaucoma patients. So this is a serous printout. This is one of my patients. I just put it up here to kind of go through what is this printout showing us? Kind of looking like looking at a visual field printout. This, the same data is presented a variety of different ways uh, and, and different things are gonna help us out more. So up here, we're going to have um, something about the quality of the image. In this particular instrument, it's called a signal strength, but in other instruments, it's called something else. But just like a visual field, you always wanna know if you've got good information. Most of them are gonna give us some kind of color-coded thickness map. In this case, the thickness is the thicker we get, the hotter the colors. So yellows and reds are what we expect in the area where we have our nerve fiber layer. Most are gonna give us some type of a deviation map. This is very similar to the deviation maps on a visual field where it's showing us where this patient isn't stacking up compared to normals of their age. Um, we're going to get a thickness profile. Now, to my mind, this is the money shot of any RNFL OCT. So in this case, it's giving us neuroretinal rim thickness starting on the temporal side, moving around to superior, nasal, inferior, and closing the circle temporally again. So this is showing us the rim thickness of the optic nerve, and then the same thing for RNFL thickness. So within this measuring circle, starting temporally, moving superior, nasal, inferior, and temporal, and we get this T-SNT curve. We've got right eye and left eye superimposed, and those are superimposed onto our normative 
color, uh, color coded green, yellow, and red. Most of the instruments will give some type of either quadrant or clock hour or sector thickness as well. Um, and then most of the instruments will also give us some quantitative parameters. And this is going to be things like that disk area and the disk uh, um, side, the disk area, the rim volume, those kinds of things. So a systematic strategy, I'm a firm believer and I'm a teacher, so I guess it makes sense um, that we use a systematic strategy every time we look at an OCT printout. And so just like you would never start your slit lamp by looking in the vitreous, you're always going to look at lids and lashes first and work your way through. I'm um, looking at an OCT is the same thing. So the first thing we want to do is look and see how good a quality is this image. And so we can look at the signal strength or whatever your instrument calls it, um, but we want to look at more than that. We want to look at this image right here and we want to see where is the optic disc within this measuring circle. So the actual nerve fiber layer that's being measured is within this circle. And so down here, you can see this disc is well centered, but occasionally the instrument will get it wrong and the disc will be misplaced because the thickness of the nerve fiber layer increases as we get closer to the optic disc, we, we don't want that because it's going to give us faulty measures inferiorly and superiorly because the disc isn't centered. I just, this is pretty rare these days because the instruments are pretty good about centering the disc. But just last week, I had a patient whose disc was not centered in the circle. And um, I realized that our technician, it had been a long time since she had seen one. She just didn't recognize that it was not centered. If it's not centered, if you can't center it manually by going back into the instrument, you just need to rescan the patient. You also want to look for areas like these uh, black areas. So anywhere on this color map where there's a black area, it just means the B scan quality wasn't good enough for the instrument to get a measurement. And so everywhere that it's black on this color is going to show up as zero thickness. Um, if that's way off in the corners, that's probably not a big deal. But if that black, the zero measurements get within that measuring circle, it's going to create a lot of problems for all the other ways that the instrument is looking at this. So, um, you know, sometimes you can't help this, but oftentimes having the patient blink, putting in some artificial tears, that sort of thing can help to get a better scan. We also want to look for movement artifacts or motion artifacts. You can see that here in this image. We have blood vessels that come out of the disc. They come down and then they suddenly jump over there. Uh, and so we don't want to see those motion artifacts either. I typically look at the color map. It's kind of like looking at the grayscale to me. It gives me a, a sense of, of overall, what am I looking at? And we want the, the thickness map to look similar to this. We want yellows and reds in this kind of tilted bow tie pattern. So we want thick nerve fiber layer just adjacent to 12 o'clock and just adjacent to six o'clock in each eye. When I look at the deviation map, what we're looking at, or excuse me, when I look at the deviation map, I'm going to get areas where this patient isn't stacking up. So here's the thickness map for a patient and the corresponding uh, deviation map. We can see, we see yellows and reds in the inferior RNFL. We don't really see those colors up top. And when we look at the deviation map, that whole area is identified as significantly thin. I have your importance of blood vessels just to remind you that the instrument segments out the nerve fiber layer for us, but within that nerve fiber layer, it's not just ganglion cell axons. There are ganglion cell axons, there's glial tissue, and there are blood vessels. And in fact, the blood vessels um, make up a large portion of the thickness of the uh, nerve fiber layer. And so when you get a scan that looks like this, where you're just kind of seeing these blood vessels, there's probably almost no ganglion cell axons there. We're just that we're getting thickness measurements only from the blood vessels. And that's why you'll never have an RNFL thickness that's absolutely zero unless you don't have any blood vessels in the eye. So uh, when we get something that looks like this, we know the actual axon thickness is very, very thin here. Again, money shot here, we have our neuroretinal rim thickness. In this example, the right eye is the solid line, the left eye is the dashed line, and then we have the nerve fiber layer from within the measuring circle, again, temporal, superior, nasal, inferior, and then closing the circle uh, 
going around temporally again. Now this neuroretinal rim thickness is actually pretty good at picking up notches in the neural retinal rim. We should be pretty good at that too, right? We should be able to see that with our slit lamp and our 78 or 60D lens. Um, but that is, uh, this is actually a pretty good um, picker outer of um, uh, notching of the optic nerve. Uh, and you can see that here. So in this left eye, there's almost no rim here superiorly. And we see that down here. In the right eye, it gets very, the rim gets very, very thin right here. And we see that right there. I have to say, I don't really use the quadrants and the clock hours very much. Um, occasionally I'll look at them, but um, I would much prefer to look at the profile uh, but you can see like superiorly in this eye, in the right eye, it's 83. In the left eye, it's 65. You'll see the color coded probabilities in terms of the reference database, the normative database. So the yellow is the thinnest 5%. The red is the thinnest 1%. So when we're getting lots of yellows and reds, we're probably not dealing with a normal nerve fiber layer. Doesn't mean it's glaucoma, um, but it's not normal compared to other people their age. Again, I don't look a whole lot uh, at these individual parameters, but they're there if you want to look at them. Um, disc area is an interesting one. Um, I had never noticed this before. I usually measure this, the disc height at the slit lamp. I just make a thin beam and I shorten it down to reach the top and bottom of the disc. And I know from with the lens that I use, if you know a disc is about 2.0 with my lens or bigger, that's a big disc. So I can expect a physiologically big cup. Uh, a friend of mine pointed out that the um, disc area on the Cirrus OCT often is very, very close to that vertical disc height. And I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna say that's absolutely true, but I have seen that, that it, it correlates actually pretty well. This is a spectralis printout, and I have to say, I don't have a spectralis. Um, I've gotten these images from friends of mine or from journal articles or from the companies themselves. There may be updated printouts of these instruments, but I just put this in here to show you that really everything that I just went over on the other printout, you'll find in this printout as well. So one of the things that spectralis does a beautiful job of is um, asymmetry. And so in this example, this is, you can't really see the numbers, but this is asymmetry of the nerve fiber layer um, between the right and left eye, um, which is a really important thing to look at in glaucoma. You'll also see the T-SNP curve. This is a little bit jaggier. The uh, cirrus sort of smooths it out. This one's a little bit um, more irregular. Um, but just like the other printout that I showed you, you have superimposition of one T-SNP, the left, over the right. And so in this example here, you know, I don't really need to look at these quadrants and sectors to know that this is an abnormal nerve fiber layer because I can see this big difference in the superior area. The left eye, the lighter gray is much thinner than the right. And when we go inferior, it's the opposite. The right eye is much thinner. And so if we look at our quadrants, we actually see that reflected in the color coding. I find this much more valuable than looking at reds, yellows, and greens. I will stop for a second and talk about the importance of disc size and axial length and refractive error. So I've already mentioned disc size. As we get closer to the disc, closer to the edge of the disc, the nerve fiber layer stacking up on itself and that measurement gets thicker. If you have a very small optic disc, the circle is gonna be measuring much further away from that disc and the measurement is likely to be much thinner. If you have a really big optic disc, that measuring circle is going to be much closer uh, to the edges of that optic nerve and it's probably going to give you a much thicker measurement um, than, than you would for an average size disc. When we talk about refractive error, I'm really talking about axial length. So the, the 12 degree spot size from the OCT um, on a typical emetropic eye will create a, a spot size of 3.4 millimeters. But if you have a really tiny hyperopic eye, that 12 degree spot size, that circle is going to be smaller. Maybe you have a great big long myopic eyeball, that circle is going to be much bigger, measuring further away from the disc, uh, and you're likely to get very thin measurements on those axial myopes. I will say axial myopes are 
really challenging to interpret their OCTs. Their eyes are just so different. So I'm gonna go on to another case. This is Victor. And I'm gonna ask you, a, I'm gonna do a polling question for Victor here in a few minutes. Victor 61, he was referred to me for a glaucoma evaluation because his CD ratio was big. Ocular and medical history are really not remarkable for the case. No glaucoma in his family. Um, his vision is good, his prelims are normal, his slit lamp is normal, there aren't any secondary signs of glaucoma. His gonioscopy is open to his ciliary body and it's normal. His pressures are 18 in the right, 15 in the left. I'm gonna show you Victor's optic nerves. I'm gonna let you look at it for a second. And here are Victor's visual fields. Now I know on those first two, I didn't show you any OCTs, but I'm gonna go ahead. We've been talking about OCTs. I'm gonna go ahead and give you Victor's OCT to take a peek at. If we look up at the top, we've got good scan quality. We've got bright colors, like really hot colors in our superior and inferior RNFL. If we look at our average RNFL, 107, 121, really, really thick. Okay. We look at the profiles. This reminds me of the Denver airport, you know, those big white peaks, you know, at the Denver airport. I mean, he's like off the charts thick in his nerve fiber layer. And here's his quadrant and sector analysis. So I think we're probably ready to launch the poll. Do you think this is glaucoma? And Danica, you mentioned you mentioned that um, you know those axial myopes are a little bit challenging. And one of the things we like to point out with these OCTs is that these normative databases aren't huge, right? A lot of people, if you just ask yourself, how many people? You ask the audience, not you, Danica, but ask the people that are taking us tonight. How many people do you think are in these normative databases? Yeah, and I'm going to do that actually in a, in a minute. Oh. I'm, I'm, that's okay. actually one of the things I'm going to talk about because it's really tricky to, to compare somebody who's sort of outside of the typical anything within these reference databases. Then I'm not going to answer the question. I'll wait for you to come up in your presentation. <laughs> well, Greg, as you brought it up, I will throw I will throw a trivia question out to you, to you both. Humphrey visual feet, Humphrey visual Mick field, Jagger. the first the the first stat pack analysis that, that we had. How many people were in the normative database? No idea. Greg, no one. Twelve. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, twelve. Twelve. <laughs> okay. They had, tw they, had tw they had 12 people in the normative database when we, when we first started using stat pack for visual fields. So 12 people in that normative database. Wow. Yep. Wow. So this is interesting. The poll results, is this glaucoma? 21% are saying yes. 62% are saying no. 17% are asking for additional information. And I have to I have to say, I don't know what additional information you would want because I've, I've given you intraocular pressures. I could tell you PACs, but I don't think it's really gonna matter. So PACs only tell us something about the intraocular pressure. They don't tell us whether or not a patient has glaucoma. Uh, and I showed you the OCT. So it's interesting to me. I always have some, some people who stick by, I want more information. Um, but the majority of you said, no, this is not glaucoma. And I'm gonna spend a few minutes uh, trying to convince you that it is. But first, I actually want to get into exactly what Dr. Caldwell was just talking about, which is this normative database. It's probably better to call it a reference database. This is a database that the instrument companies create. Uh, it's a reference population without disease who are scanned to create what's expected, what is normal. And we can use this reference database to classify the patient's data as normal or abnormal. But the problem is that abnormal data doesn't necessarily mean diseased. And, and the, the example I like to give, because I think you know, it's one that we're all familiar with, 
is if you think about intraocular pressure, right, and the, and the big population-based study that looked at intraocular pressure and came up with, you know, 15 and a half plus or minus two standard deviations, so 10 to 22, right, that's normal. Well, you could have intraocular pressure that's 25, that's abnormal compared to the database, but it doesn't mean you have a disease. And so it's kind of the same thing with these reference databases, right? So it will tell us how the patient stacks up to who the instrument has already you know, tested and put into their database, but it doesn't necessarily tell us that the patient has a disease. Now, sometimes one of, the, one of the problems that can happen with these databases is that they can become sort of hypernormal. And so I don't know about you, but in my glaucoma clinic, a ton of them are diabetic, right? Well, if you don't include patients with diabetes in your database, how well does that you know, represent my patients who happen to have diabetes, or, you know, maybe they can't have high refractive errors. That's a big one for imaging because imaging is really different in eyes that are, you know, really long. Um, and so some of these databases are, are kind of hyper normal and an unfair comparison for our patients. Um, and then the size of the database um, and this is, I think, what Dr. Caldwell was getting to earlier. Um, and I have your RT view is OptiView. I think originally it had the largest database of 600 eyes, um, sectioned out by age, by disc size, and by ethnic group. And they had uh, quite a variety of ethnicities represented in the database. Um, but 600 eyes is the largest database. The Cirrus, the one that I use, 284 eyes, uh, age 18, 19 to 84 but I think only three or four patients under the age of 21. If I'm doing a scan on a patient who's 20 years old and they're getting compared to three people, is that a, right, is that a reasonable comparison? Now they did have a pretty good range of refractive errors, but most of them weren't in these high ends. And they had a reasonable um, mix of ethnicities that you can see here. Now the Spectralis original database was 201 patients, all Caucasian. And if you have, and, and I have to say that I meant to look this up and I forgot, they were working on an updated database that was uh, intended to reflect the ethnic diversity of the United States. I don't know if that's ever been cleared. If it has, then this information is wrong. But on the Spectralis, uh, at least when it was using this database, it would say, you know, be cautious uh, applying this to non-Caucasian patients. So this is not a slam against the instrument companies. It's very expensive for them to create these databases, um, but it is important to understand what you're comparing your patient to. The normative distribution is going to be represented in some kind of a red, yellow, green color. Uh, and the cirrus, the only one that has this white is the cirrus. And I don't know why they do it, but in, in their case, white represents the thickest 5%, the upper 5% of the database. Green represents the middle 90%, but in the other instruments, it represents the top 95%. Yellow represents the thinnest 5% or lowest 5%, and red is the lowest 1%. Anything that's gray means that something about that doesn't fall within the normative database. And so you can imagine that if you have a um, um, an all green OCT, you go like, whew, that makes me feel good. But green in most instruments goes from 6% to 100%. So, you know, I used to tell my daughters, like, I don't want you to get a 70, 70s passing, I want you to get a hundred, you know? Um, green could be really, really good or green could be almost bad, right? It's, it's these stoplight colors uh, can be a little misleading. So if we go back to Victor, so I think 62% of you said that Victor did not have glaucoma. I want to look at his OCT a little more carefully. So the first thing I want to look at is, a, is a, all this gray. So remember, reds, yellows, and greens, unless you fall outside of the reference database, and then you're gray. So something about him is falling outside of the database. And it turns out it's the disc area. And so he has really large optic discs. So remember, these measuring circles are going to be measuring closer to the edge of the disc, might measure a little thicker than we would expect. 
When we look at his actual measurements, 107, that's really thick. 121, that's really thick. But look at the difference between the right and left eye. If my math is right, that's a 14 micron difference in the average RNFL thickness between the right and left eye. That's a lot of difference. I mean, probably somewhere between eight and 10 microns difference in the average RNFL should really pique your interest about glaucoma, even if it's really thick. We can look at this, and I said I don't look at the quadrants and the sectors very often, but we can look at it a little more carefully down here. In the superior quadrant of his right eye, 115 microns compared to 159 microns in the left eye. We can even dig down a little bit more and we can say 126 microns in this really important supratemporal sector versus 174 microns. So when I'm looking at this, yes, it's all green and even white because he's so thick, but there's definitely some asymmetry here. When I look at the T-SNP profile, and I'll actually go back a slide. When I look, yes, he's really thick, but look at the left eye, the dashed line superiorly versus the right eye, the solid line superiorly. We're pretty symmetrical people. Look at your right hand compared to your left hand. Look at your right foot compared to your left foot, right? Our nerves and our nerve fiber layer should be pretty symmetric. And at least in this superior sector here, he is not symmetric. The right, the superior nerve fiber layer in his right eye is significantly thinner than it is in the left eye. If we go back to his optic nerves, I would say that this left optic nerve is super good and healthy and normal. But when I look at this right optic nerve and I put the isn't rule, I apply the isn't rule, you know, this superior rim is pretty thin. We look at these blood vessels that are going across defining the superior rim. It's significantly thinner than that inferior rim. And if I have a problem with my superior rim, where should my visual field be affected? right down here. And so I have correlation with my disc findings, my nerve fiber layer findings, and my visual field findings. Now, I you probably didn't pay too much attention to his pressure and I can't even remember the numbers, but every time I saw Victor, his right intraocular pressure was about three or four millimeters higher than his left. And just in case you don't believe me, let's look at this disc a little more carefully. And what do you see right here? You see the disc hemorrhage, which is kind of like the red flag that says, hey, you, look at me. I probably have glaucoma. You can also see a little nerve fiber layer slit. It's pretty small. This isn't red free, but you can see it. So this isn't a poll. Uh, I almost made this a poll question. Oh. Uh, this is his um, structure function plot. And this is a little bit later on. Uh, and you can see clear difference, especially superiorly right versus left uh, nerve fiber layer and a well-defined uh, inferior partial arcuate defect. He has glaucoma and we could see that um, at his earliest scan. So I was gonna put a polling question in here that says, those of you who said he doesn't have glaucoma, do you believe me now? But I didn't put that in because I didn't think that sounded um, nice. Oh, here it is. So it's just here, but it's not a real polling question. I hope I did convince you that Victor has glaucoma. So that leads me to two terms that you've probably heard before, but maybe not thought too much about, um, red disease and green disease. So this was the first article in Current Opinions of Ophthalmology, uh, glaucoma versus red disease, imaging and glaucoma diagnosis. And really the whole gist of this article, by the way, if you want this, it's almost 10 years old, but it's, it's, a, it's not a bad article at all. I can send it to you if you send me an email. Um, this is really just talking about being careful about looking only at reds, yellows, and greens. So the key points here, glaucoma imaging is really important for us. It's, it's, it's helpful for us. Um, but if we don't think about the reference databases and understand that just having red doesn't mean that you have disease, we're gonna be calling people glaucoma when they really don't have a progressive disease that needs to be treated. 
The flip side of, green, of red disease is green disease. And that's actually what Victor has. So green disease is where your OCT looks all green and pretty and you're feeling great about it, but the patient actually does have disease. And, you know, I think about, you know, which is worse, you know, to miss somebody who has glaucoma or to overcall it. And the truth is, I'm not sure which is worse. Most people would say, it's worse to miss the glaucoma that's out there. But I actually think that treating something that's not glaucoma is not ideal either because our medications, our lasers, they cost money, they have side effects. Uh, there's emotional, um, there are emotional effects of being diagnosed with a potentially blinding disease. So I don't think we wanna err on either of these sides. So in green disease, it's really important. I'm gonna skip through this one. Um, uh, green disease is really important to look at more than those reds, yellows, and greens. In Victor's case, he was completely green, even white, really thick, but he still clearly has glaucoma. And we'll, I'll show you another uh, thing. You can have a lot of movement within the green, meaning a patient starts out green, but they lose nerve fiber layer. If they started off high enough, thick enough, they can stay in that green. And if you're not looking at some of those other things on your printout, you're going to miss that. Other errors or pitfalls of, of OCT include errors and artifacts. Um, and those are things like, um, you know, dry eye, um, we always put a teardrop in our patient's eye before we capture an OCT. Things like any kind of media opacity will make the nerve fiber layer measurement thinner. Um, I've already talked about these black areas. This patient happened to have large Weiss rings from his PVD um, that were always within the measuring circle and always just causing problems for us here on this OCT. Um, this is a blink, you've probably all seen this before. Um, you know, when you get this, you just roll your eyes and ask them, the technician to please get another scan for you because this is going straight across that measuring circle. So they're gonna register zero here and zero here and everything is gonna get screwed up because the instrument can only analyze or can only present the data that it has you have to be the one to analyze it. Motion artifacts we've already talked about as well. And there are a lot of errors in our scans. Um, these, are probably, these are probably a little outdated, but uh, you know, 20% of spectralis uh, RNFL scans have some type of error that could affect the quality and uh, affect your interpretation. Uh, when we look at serous optic nerve scans, you know, 35% can have some type of um, artifact or error. So artifacts can affect how you interpret the OCT. So you need to be looking for them. And then the third pitfall of OCT, I think, is not recognizing that not everything that causes nerve fiber layer loss is glaucoma. So there are a lot of different things that can cause nerve fiber layer loss that aren't glaucoma. So um, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, I, I shouldn't have the in there. Any kind of anterior ischemic optic neuropathy can cause nerve fiber layer loss that can look very much like glaucoma. Uh, retinal dystrophies can cause nerve fiber layer loss. Vein occlusions, and in fact, vein occlusions and artery occlusions, branch ones, especially because they'll follow one um, kind of arcade, tend to look very much like glaucoma. So you really have to remember that not everything that causes nerve fiber layer loss is glaucoma. Optic neuritis, other types of optic neuropathies, nutritional or toxic, for example. PVDs can actually make the nerve fiber layer thicker as it's kind of just getting ready, as the vitreous is just getting ready to pull away, the nerve fiber layer measurement may be thicker. Once it pulls, that goes back. It may look like your patients had a sudden drop in their nerve fiber layer. If you look back and when it was thicker, they didn't have a vitreous detachment noted in their chart, and now they do, that may be why. Uh, and then high myopia, just kind of all bets are off with high myopia. This is a, a colleague's husband, and she just came to me with this. Uh, this is all she said, hey, would you see my husband? Uh, look, he's got visual field loss and he's got corresponding nerve fiber layer defects. And, you know, when we look at this OCT, there's definitely less RNFL on this right eye compared to this left eye. This left eye is bright reds and yellows where we expect it. The, the left one, not so much. And it looks like there's this kind of wedge defect here, which correlates with this superior arcuate defect. I said, sure, I'll see him. 
Uh, let's see if you think that's glaucoma. That's all the information I'm going to give you. We'll launch this poll. Yep, it's up and running. I see. And I don't think there's any questions in the chat box. I did launch the handout quite some time back. Okay. Um, yep, there's no the, questions in the chat box. Okay. This is actually one of my favorite cases. Rolling in nicely. We're up to about 75%. All right. Remember, everyone, we like to get the percentage high. It helps us show with the regulatory bodies that these are live and interactive. <laughs> and we're almost there. Come on. All right. People. Yes. <laughs> there must oh, let me, I'm going to mute Sally. Hold on. Uh, there was a question in there that says, how do you get the structure function report that I showed previously? Um, I happen to have Forum, which is uh, Carl Zeiss Meditech's data management system. And that's just one of the reports that you can get. And I will say, I don't, I probably wouldn't use that a whole, whole lot if I were just in practice on my own, but it is amazing to show my students and to be able, like with Victor, I think it was, you know, when you put it all together like that, it's really easy to see how everything correlates. So this is interesting. We've got 40% saying this is glaucoma, 19% saying no, and 40% saying you need more information. And I take full responsibility for that because I didn't give you very much information. But let me just show you this. This is not glaucoma. <laughs> this guy had an injury when he was younger, some kind of a BB gun injury, and he has this big gigantic macular scar. And guess what happens there? Ganglion cells die and their axons also die, but that doesn't cause cupping. That causes pallor, whoops. So if we go back here and you look at how pink the nasal side of his disc looks, but over here it's a little pale. This is not glaucoma. I just think it's an, an interesting case that shows, you know, you have to look at everything. And I worry that as our technology gets better and better, and as we become a little more reliant on it, that we somehow, you know, relegate our clinical exam to an afterthought. Um, and, and he doesn't have glaucoma. Um, this is just a, a retinal problem that resulted in nerve fiber layer loss and a visual field that look a whole lot like glaucoma. Yeah, I think that's just a great way to pointing out that, you know, this is an optic neuropathy. It's just not glaucoma, it's optic neuropathy. Exactly, exactly. And we could actually see that if we go back, um, it's, he has a little tiny nerve, so it's a little weird. He, he does look like he has a little bit of thinning uh, inferiorly, but you certainly don't see a tremendous amount of cupping in that nerve. So some key points regarding the optic nerve and nerve fiber layer scans, you really need clinical correlation. That's why I put Kevin's um, case in there. So we really want everything to kind of match up. I always tell my students that glaucoma is not always easy, but it always correlates with one another. If you've got damage to the superior part of the nerve, you should have an inferior visual field defect. If you're seeing RNFL thinning in your in your OCT, you ought to be able to see that in your clinical exam or in your, in your fundus exam. So never interpret an OCT printout in isolation, just like you'd never look at a visual field in isolation without knowing more about the patient. Um, in situations where the disc is anomalous, really big, really small, tilted, obliquely inserted, highly myopic, the reference database is gonna let you down. And so you're likely to get lots of reds and yellows on your scan. And that doesn't mean that we can't use the OCT, but it does mean it's not gonna be as good for diagnosis. We can still use it to watch patients for progression because a weird disc that's not progressing, that there's nothing progressing should just stay weird. And so it should, it should still stay, stay stable over time. So just recognize that if you're looking at a disc and you're thinking this is weird looking, your OCT is going to be weird looking as well. Okay, the last polling question for the night is, are you doing macular OCTs in your glaucoma patients and glaucoma suspects? And your choices are yes, 
no, or you're crazy. And it wouldn't be the first time somebody told me that. So. They're rolling in nicely. Yay, this is good. You know, it's so weird. I'm, I'm gonna be going to Wisconsin next week and it will be the first time I've been in front of a live audience, not just looking at the camera on my computer in over 18 months. It's so strange, but there are people out there listening to me and I can't see them. You'll take it up like riding a bicycle. I remember the first time <laughs> that, uh, that I did it last year and it's a strange feeling, but yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of neat. Like when you leave the airport, you feel you're doing the right thing. And then by the time you leave, you kind of exhale a little bit. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm still having meetings canceled even right now. All right. I'm going to end the poll. I'll okay. share the results with you. Oh, you only got two to tell you that you're crazy. So, well, you know, that's fair. That's fair. I'm, and I might be crazy. Don't ask my husband. Um, yeah, about a little over half are doing macular scans and, and some are not. So what I'm going to move into is the newest addition to our glaucoma diagnosis arsenal. And, and I, I should say there are some even newer things I'm not going to get to like with OCTA. I'm just not sure those things are quite ready for prime time, um, but this certainly is. And I, I wanna just kind of give a little bit of history to it because I think it's really interesting. Back before the turn of the century, there was a guy named Zymer who was using a, he was using a lab-based optical uh, um, scanning laser ophthalmoscope. I couldn't think of the name. So this was like a big gigantic instrument and he was bringing subjects into his lab and he was measuring their macular thickness with this, uh, you know, um, instrument. And um, he could show that in patients who had glaucomatous visual field damage, he could show that their macula was thinner than patients who were normal. Okay, well, that's great, but that was not something that was, that was clinically available. And so the researchers were interested, but clinicians probably didn't even know about it. I certainly didn't know about it at the time. Move forward to 2003, David Greenfield was one of the first people to report on a correlation between the total macular thickness. So this is just using the standard macular cube scan and looking at that central or total macular thickness. Um, and he could correlate that very well with the mean deviation, the pattern standard deviation, on a Humphrey visual field. And this was even using time domain OCT. So this was uh, not even using our best instruments that we have today. Even still, this was a little closer to being able to use, but nobody at this point was really doing macular scans for our glaucoma patients and suspects. But a lot of what we know uh, about the macula and glaucoma really can be attributed to Don Hood and his large team of researchers at Columbia University. Uh, he and his group did an extensive investigation of the layer of the OCT, a segmented layer called the uh, retinal ganglion cell plus. It's the retinal ganglion cell plus the inner plexiform layers on an, on an OCT. Those two layers are very dif difficult to separate out. So they included those uh, and they call it the RGC plus. And they also coined a term macular vulnerability zone. And so, you know, this is really giving um, short shrift to his research team, uh, but these are a couple of images out of one of his uh, bigger articles. The first thing that his team did was very carefully map out where individual retinal ganglion cells placed their axons, where those axons inserted in the nerve. They did this first, with um, cadaver eyes and also then in uh, non-human primates. And they were very good. They could very precisely map. If you have a ganglion cell right here where my arrow is, it's gonna insert its axon right here on the optic nerve. So they spent a lot of time making sure that this was a real thing that they could do. The next thing they said was, hey, we know that this area kind of infratemporally on the optic nerve is the most commonly damaged location on the nerve in glaucoma. So where do those ganglion cell bodies reside? Here are the axons, where are those ganglion cells? And it turns out that they are just inferior and just temporal to the fovea. And this is what he calls the uh, macular vulnerability zone. 
Now, all of our commercially available instruments currently have a, a glaucoma specific macular protocol. So we don't have to take a retinal macular scan and do a bunch of gymnastics with it. The instrument's gonna do it for us. This is kind of old, but I think it's relatively accurate. So the OptiView has a ganglion cell complex. Now their segmentation, and I don't think it matters that much for the purpose of this discussion, is neurofiber layer plus um, retinal ganglion cell interplexiforms. They include the neurofiber layer. Some people think that's a bad idea. I really don't know. And it compares to a normative database. The spectralis actually uses the full thickness of the macula and really um, looks at it looks at thickness, but it does a really beautiful uh, symmetry analysis between right and left eye. And then the cirrus, which is what uh, Don Hood had reported on, uses this ganglion cell interplexiform layer and compares to a normative database. So just a couple of just a couple of images. This is an OptiView. I think they've changed the way their printout looks. But essentially, on all these macular scans, what we expect to see uh, is nothing in the fovea. Remember, we don't have any ganglion cells in our fovea. They're just kind of squished out a little bit. So we don't have any ganglion cells in our fovea, but we should have a pretty uniform ring of thick ganglion cell or ganglion cell interplexiform. It's going to show you a deviation map and then a significance map with those stoplight colors. This is some like this is pretty much what the OptiView looks like. I think uh, this is the cirrus. This is actually one of my patients. Again, we don't see uh, ganglion cell thickness in the fovea because we don't have ganglion cells there. We should see a relatively uniform kind of yellowish orange donut surrounding that. Uh, and one of the hallmark signs of glaucoma is what is technically termed the temporal raffe sign, but what a lot of people call the squeegee sign, the putty knife sign. I think Dr. Salpa calls it the nautilus sign because it looks like a nautilus seashell. But you know, just thinking about the way that the um, nerve fiber layer, just everything stops right at this temporal raffe. And this is that macular vulnerability zone, infratemporal to the fovea. Now, on this particular printout, you see your colors, but then you also see these uh, deviation maps. This is a very characteristic glaucomatous deviation on this scan. So it goes straight across temporally, and it's going to start to kind of expand going back toward the nasal side. Now, this is mm, who knows, right? So you will have some of these areas on the deviation map that, you know, like, oh, what does this mean? Probably nothing. It's really when you see this very distinct temporal loss um, that you're really looking at something that's likely glaucoma. The, the things that I look at on this scan are, I look for this temporal raffe sign, I look for it in our deviation map, and then I look at these two temporal sectors in each eye, 77, 78, these should be really pretty close to one another. Look over here, 75 and 65. A 10 micron difference across that horizontal midline is really significant. And then the spectralis, these are um, images from Heidelberg. Uh, they really base their entire macular scan on symmetry and the fact that we are pretty symmetrical people. And so what they have created is an eight by eight grid of thickness centered on the fovea. And you'll notice, I think you can see these numbers. They're much higher. Remember that one I just showed you was like 75. These numbers are in the 300s or in the high 200s because they're measuring the entire thickness of the macula. And it creates an asymmetry map, which is gonna show us where this patient's inferior ganglion cell or macular thickness is, how it is compared to the mirror image superiorly. And they also do a right left symmetry that you see here. So we have thickness measurements, superior, superior hemifield, inferior hemifield in total, but we also have hemisphere asymmetry plots and right eye, left eye asymmetry plots. So anywhere where there are really dark squares, um, that's showing that in that particular eye, that area is thin relative to the mirror image of it. So the advantages of using the macula compared to RNFL in glaucoma diagnosis is that glaucoma is really a disease of retinal ganglion cells. And 50% of our retinal ganglion cells live in our macula. So if I want to study people, I'm going to go to New York City where the population is really dense, right? So glaucoma is a disease of ganglion cells. Let's look 
where they live. Um, also, macular thinning or irregularity really cannot be seen with our clinical exam. I can't sit at the slit lamp with a 78 diopter lens and say, oh, I think the inferior temporal ganglion cell thickness is a little thin. I can't see it. I have to rely on my OCT imaging. Whereas I can see nerve fiber layer loss with my slit lamp and my 78. Also, the macula is a more reproducible measure. It has a much tighter test-retest variability um, compared to peripapillary nerve fiber layer measurements, which are pretty good, but still have four or five microns uh, you know, variability scan to scan. There are fewer blood vessel and other anatomic variations in the macula compared to the peripapillary nerve uh, fiber layer. I always think about, and I talk to my students about, if you think about the last 10 macula that you looked at at the slit lamp that didn't have, you know, MACD gen or something like that, they all look exactly the same. But think about the last 10 optic nerves that you looked at. Some are tall, some are short, some are fat, some are big, some are small, some have lots of blood vessels, some don't, some have peripapillary atrophy, some don't. They're really, really different. And so the macular scans, you're, you're scanning an area that just has more uniformity um, and, and more symmetry than the peripapillary nerve fiber layer. Of course, nothing's perfect, right? So there are times when these macular scans just aren't gonna be helpful at all. And so anytime you have macular disease, particularly inner uh, retinal macular disease, but really any macular disease, your ganglion cell or your, your glaucoma protocol OCT scan is probably not gonna work well. I think the worst is epiretinal membrane. When you have an epiretinal membrane, you may as well just not get the glaucoma macular protocol scan. It just distorts everything. It's very difficult for the instrument to segment anything out properly, uh, cystoid macular edema, diabetic macular edema, even AMD, although I would say because AMD is uh, you know, a, a, an outer retinal uh, disease, probably your AMD scans would look better from a glaucoma standpoint than you know, your, your epiretinal membranes, for example. I said at the beginning that I was gonna come back to this article by Michael Sullivan Me, and it's actually, I was looking at it's, you know, um, eight years old now, but it still gives really good information. I'll tell you that he was using the Spectralis OCT uh, and looking at his, you know, his glaucoma patients, his early glaucoma patients, and he came up with four parameters that were really highly diagnostic of early glaucoma. Um, so this is with one particular instrument. I don't think we can absolutely apply these numbers to other instruments, but I think we can apply the principles. And so he found, his group found that an inter eye, meaning right, left, macular thickness asymmetry of five microns was highly diagnostic of glaucoma. That's really interesting. That's five microns. Think about how big a micron is, but that was a really important parameter. Intra-eye superior inferior uh, macular thickness asymmetry of nine microns or more. Um, so on that asymmetry plot, uh, inter-eye, right, left, nerve fiber layer, average thickness difference of nine microns or more. And then in this case, a total or average nerve fiber layer thickness measurement of 78 microns uh, or less. Those were all for just about equivalent in um, their you know, sensitivity and specificity for an early glaucoma diagnosis. So let me just show you, this is out of his article. Uh, and you've, I think I've already shown you the Spectralis OCT. So here we have, you know, an OCT that looks pretty much in the green, you know, maybe dips down into the yellow right here. Um, but if we look at our average or global RNFL thickness, it's 90 microns in the right eye and 101 microns in the left eye. So that's an asymmetry of 11. And remember in his study, nine was kind of this tipping point. But you know, again, you can go right up here and see that the right nerve fiber layer, the dark one, is much thinner inferiorly than the left. So we don't have to remember these guidelines, but it is you know, sometimes helpful to have them. Here's another example from his article, and this is looking at macular thickness. And so if we look at this, we can see already there's right-left asymmetry in our asymmetry plot. There's 
uh, hemisphere superior inferior asymmetry within the right eye, we see that the inferior thickness is much thinner than the superior. So if we look at right left macular thickness asymmetry, looking at our totals 280 versus 292, it's a 12 micron difference between the two eyes. And in his uh, study, a difference of five microns was significant. If we look at superior inferior asymmetry of the right eye, 287 versus 283, excuse me, 273, that's 14 microns different. That exceeds his sort of tipping point. And if we compare that to the left eye, look, 292, 292. So these things are really important. And I think asymmetry is something that I don't know that we talk enough about it in glaucoma, but there's so much asymmetry, right eye to left eye, superior to inferior. And that really plays out both in our nerve and nerve fiber layer, as well as our macular thickness measurements. Here's a case for you. This is Leo, 71 year old African-American man that got referred to me for a glaucoma suspicion. And realistically, it was pretty much based on the fact that he was an older African-American gentleman. So in the population that we would expect a higher rate of glaucoma and his intraocular pressure was 23. Doesn't really raise my eyebrows too much, but I'm happy to take a look at him. He's diabetic and hypertensive. There's no glaucoma in his family that he's aware of. Uh, everything was going well in his exam. Pressure's 23 in each eye. And that was mitigated to some extent by thick central cornea. So I really wasn't bothered by these um, intraocular pressures. Here's his OCT. And so I think when I look at this, you know, I can say, oh, I always look at X or Y, but it's pretty hard to ignore this big blob of yellow and red in this deviation map in his left eye inferiorly. And if we look down in our our sector clock hour map, he's got a red sector. And you know, the, the two sectors or the two clock hours that we wanna look most carefully at are the ones just temporal to 12 o'clock and the ones just temporal to six o'clock. So in the right eye, it's 11 and seven. In the left eye, it's one and five. And so in Leo's scan, we see red at this seven o'clock or excuse me, five o'clock hour, and we see yellow in the fellow line. So, okay, this OCT doesn't look all that great to me. It makes me like, huh, what's going on? These are his visual fields, and I can promise you that we repeated them and they were completely normal, but even these visual fields, just got a little overall deviation, nothing that looks glaucomatous, and certainly nothing that would correlate with an OCT that we just looked at. So what are we missing here, right? If we look at our average RNFL, it's 94 in the right, 87 in the left. That's really pretty thick. Difference of seven microns. So there is a difference in thickness between the right and left eye. I don't know how significant that is. But the thing I really want you to um, pay attention to is these nerves. And I don't think there's a person on this webinar that would say that these nerves are even remotely glaucomatous. These are the nerves of a 71 year old individual. And I'll tell you, I don't even know if my nerves look that good. When you look at these nerves, there is thickness to be had, right? It's just a beautiful nerve in each eye. So what the heck is making his OCT look like it did with that little blob in the deviation map? It's a little tricky thing that sometimes happens when the blood vessels come out of the disc in an unusual location. So way at the beginning of this talk, I was talking about when the instrument segments out the RNFL, there's blood vessels there. Well, the RNFL travels with the blood vessels. The, the blood vessels contribute a lot to the thickness of the RNFL segmented layer. And the instrument is expecting them to come out in the place that they normally come out. So supratemporal and infratemporal. In his left eye in particular, it happens in his right eye too, but I wanna show you the left eye. This big gigantic vein, which is going to take up a lot of thickness, is going to be responsible for a pretty significant thickness of his RNFL layer, is really significantly nasal compared to where the instrument expects it to be. So the instrument is expecting a lot of thickness here. It's not getting it. And so it says, hey, dude, you're missing some right here. Okay, it's even showing us down here. Interestingly, look in this kind of infranasal sector and you'll see white, which in this instrument means really, really thick. And so it's just a kind of a shift of where the blood vessels are supposed to be or expected to be 
but he's got good thickness. The other place to look is at his T-SNP curve. And so we have a T-SNP curve that shows beautiful peaks superiorly, slightly shifted nasally, and huge peaks inferiorly. He's got tons of nerve fiber layer. It's just shifted nasally. And so when it comes down, it kind of dips down into this red. So this is just an anatomic variation. But if you're busy and you're not thinking about this, you'll say like, oh shoot, he's got inferior nerve fiber layer. He's old, he's black, his pressure is 20. He's got glaucoma. They didn't have glaucoma. Also, sorry to interrupt Danica. One thing that when I first saw this that I thought was most impressive was the inter eye symmetry. Yes, yes, very much so. 90, say 92%, I think. I mean, especially inferiorly. Oh, yeah. Look at this. Look how, you know, this isn't the, the right eye coming up and having a big peak and the left eye kind of dipping down below like we saw with Victor. This is both eyes doing exactly the same thing. So there's a lot to look at on an OCT more than just numbers. And just for kicks, I got a, a macular OCT uh, a ganglion cell interplexiform. You know, nothing going on here. Yes, there's a little tiny bit of something there temporally. I'm not worried about it. I don't see anything that looks like a squeegee sign. He doesn't have glaucoma and he's gonna be fine. I think this may be the last case and I'm going to go into something else, but this is Tony. Tony, I just saw Tony two weeks ago. He's 51 year old, hypertensive Hispanic male. Uh, his ocular history is significant. He had LASIK in both eyes about 20 years ago. And then he had an enhancement in his left eye with PRK about seven years ago. Uh, his grandmother on his mother's side has glaucoma had glaucoma, um, he does not know much about her glaucoma. VAs are good without correction. Every, all of his entry tests are normal. His angles are open to ciliary body with gonioscopy. His pressure, we measured it several times. His pressure max was 17, but he does have quite thin corneas. And those are, of course, you know, due to his refractive surgery and thinner in the left that had an enhancement procedure. Even though Tony sees 2020 without glasses, his eyeball is a myopic eyeball, right? And so when I looked back and I saw these nerves, I said, oh shoot, these look like big gigantic myopic discs, but they're also a little bit worrisome. And I will tell you with a stereoscopic view, I was particularly bothered by this infratemporal area right here. And you don't have the benefit of the stereo view, but you're just gonna have to take my, uh, my word for it. So I went ahead and you know kind of did the whole glaucoma evaluation on him. What I would say about these OCTs is this is an OCT of a myopic eye. And it's often, it looks kind of generally thin. It doesn't really look glaucomatous, but it doesn't really look robust. He's 51, he should have lots of nerve fiber layer. And then I got his ganglion cell. And I was really surprised but it was in the exact area of concern for his nerve. So, when we look at this, I see this, which is much more of a common appearance for a highly myopic eye. And I see this, we've got some of that same stuff that looks kind of just like high myopia, but I have this very distinct temporal raffe sign. Let's move on to his visual fields. These are his visual fields and these were his first visual fields. And I would say that I probably like you just kind of went, eh, whatever. But let's move to one other topic, and that is looking at the 10-2 visual field test in early glaucoma. Now, 10 years ago, if you had asked me, hey, Danica, do you ever run 10-2s on your glaucoma patients? I would have said, yes, when the 24-2 is pretty much all gone, I'll move to a 10-2 to capture what's left. Um, but in the last you know, five to eight years, probably, we've really realized that the 10-2 visual field may be important in certain types of glaucoma patients. And again, it goes back to the fact that most of our ganglion cells live in our macula. And in fact, in the central eight degrees from the center of the fovea, about 30% of our ganglion cells live there. But our 24-2 and 30-2 test grids actually don't sample very well in that most heavily populated ganglion cell region. But the 10-2 tests exclusively in that region with a much finer stimulus spacing. So instead of points being spaced six degrees apart, they're spaced two degrees apart. So we can really zoom in. It's like zooming in on a Google map 
You can really zoom in and see what's going on visually in that central 10 degrees. So I love this image. I actually probably should make it bigger in this slide so you could really get the effect. But what we have here is obviously a color fundus photo. And then we have superimposed on it a macular ganglion cell thickness map. So this is sort of the OCT you know, that we're measuring when we're doing our macular scans. All of these big black points are the points on a 24-2 visual field test superimposed on the area that they're testing on the retina. And so you can see in this area of most dense ganglion cells, we're only testing four points, but a 10-2 does all of its testing within this blue square. So all of the points on a 10-2 are gonna fall in this really important region. If we go back to Tony, remember Tony had the infratemporal macular vulnerability zone loss in his left eye. And I really would look at this field and just kind of go, whatever. But knowing this, I say, well, huh, that's interesting. He's got this little superior paracentral point. What happens if I test a 10-2? And it turns out that this single point becomes a cluster of points that correlate to his ganglion cell loss. And I really believe that Tony has glaucoma. I don't think this is typical, but I see it more often than I expected to see it. Now that I'm looking, I'm attuned to it. And so the big question is, what do we do, right? Like, what do we do with this information? Am I running 24-2s and 10-2s on all of my patients? I'm not. I am running 24-2s on my glaucoma suspects. If the 24-2 has a glaucomatous visual field defect on it that matches up what I'm seeing clinically and on my OCT, I'm not necessarily going to get a 10-2. I have what I need to make the diagnosis. But if I have a patient who has a relatively normal 24-2 like Tony does, but he has this squeegee sign or nautilus sign or temporal raffe sign on his ganglion cell map, then that's a patient that I'm going to go ahead and do a 10-2 on. I have here watch for new test patterns. There is actually already a new test pattern, 24-2C. It's um, only available on the newest Humphrey Field Analyzer, the HFA3. Uh, and it is a 24-2 test grid with five points above and five points below the horizontal midline added uh, to that standard test grid. Um, within the central 10 degrees. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm using it. It's a little hard for me to interpret at this point because I'm still pretty new to it. But the take home message for the macula in glaucoma is that glaucoma damage to the macula is actually pretty common. We just didn't know it before we could image it. Um, glaucoma damage to the macula can, can occur early in the disease and it's not visible on our clinical exam. It's not something that we can see with our, with our direct ophthalmoscope or with our 78 diopter lens. And and glaucoma damage to the macula is not necessarily going to get picked up by our standard testing with a 24-2 or 30-2 test pattern. I'm going to move on to glaucoma progression, and I only have about 10 minutes left. Um, but I think, you know, I've talked for almost an, an hour and a half on just the diagnostic side of things. I actually think that detecting glaucomatous progression is much, much harder um, than deciding that a patient has glaucoma. Um, but the truth is once we say you've got the G, the only thing we can be concerned about is whether or not we're stabilizing the disease or it's progressing. And so this is a statement out of the uh, World Glaucoma Association's Progression of Glaucoma book. It's 10 years old, but it's still pretty important, right? Once we say that a patient has glaucoma, the, the, the clock starts again, and we're never looking for damage. We're looking to see if that damage is getting worse. And that can be pretty tricky. There are two ways that we can look for a change on our testing that we do. And this is true for visual fields, and it's true for our OCTs. Um, so one is called event analysis. I like to say this is the yes, no question. Is today's test worse than the baseline? And so that's usually indicated by change that exceeds the known variability of the test. So for a visual field, we know that there's some test-to-test -test variability. If the patient exceeds the expected amount of test-to-test -test variability, we're gonna get a little alert that this has changed. The same thing in our OCT. So if this measurement exceeds what we would expect from a test-to-test -test 
uh, variability, we're going to get a little alert. Something's happened. It's kind of the yes, no. Today's is worse than the baseline. The other way that we can look for change or look at change, I would say, is to look at trend analysis. And this is taking some measurement in an OCT. It could be average nerve fiber layer. It could be superior ganglion cell thickness, some measure and following it over time to see what the rate of change is. And so we can do those things on OCTs. This is what a typical OCT progression map would look like if you have a cirrus. So we can look for changes, the yes, no event analysis question. We can just look at the thickness maps uh, and you can see that over time, these two look like they've developed a wedge defect compared to this. Now this is pretty subjective still, but we have a deviation from baseline map that, that will show us Yellow, if we have areas that are thinner, that are exceeding the test-test variability that are thin, and then those yellows will turn red if they're repeatable. We also have that event analysis here where this patient is dipping down compared to baseline. Initially, it will shade in yellow. If it's repeatable, it will shade in red. And then for our trend analysis, we have a variety of things we can track. So average RNFL, superior RNFL, inferior RNFL, et cetera. Now, this is a patient of mine. This is a, a patient that uh, I actually still see. She obviously has very advanced glaucoma. Uh, and this is her OCT. Now you can see you only have blood vessels down here, right? So she's got like no nerve fiber layer here. But if you look back at her nerve, she still has some rim and some nerve fiber layer here. You see a disc hemorrhage here and then a separate visit, a different disc hemorrhage. You know, there are a lot of people who would say, don't get an OCT on her. The problem with her, she's a terrible visual field taker. And so about the only thing I have to watch are her intraocular pressures and this superior nerve fiber layer. Now I'm not gonna get any information about her inferior nerve fiber layer, but I still can watch her superior nerve fiber layer. And so on a, a particular visit, when I saw, you can see how thin her inferior is. When I saw this, bump down in the superior nerve fiber layer, you can bet that I was repeating that test very quickly to see if that was real, because if it is, she's losing what's left of very little nerve fiber layer that she has. Uh, again, looking at a spectralis in the um, progression analysis is going to have your baseline scan, a follow-up, and then a second follow-up. You may be able to see a little bit of red here. That's going to show uh, where the patient has changed, has thinned compared to the baseline. And then it's also going to give you trend analysis. So different sectors, how they're changing over time. So all of the instruments are going to give very similar information and in, a, in a pretty intuitive way. This is the OptiView uh, trend analysis here. So this is looking at the RNFL, average RNFL rate of change, ganglion cell complex rate of change, and so on. Now, there is normal age-related attrition of RNFL. So as you're sitting here listening to me blab about OCTs, you're sitting there losing nerve fiber layer. And the instruments don't account for the, for the normal age-related change. So when we see change, it doesn't necessarily mean it's from glaucoma. It's a little hard to understand the studies. If you look at cross-sectional studies, it'll say there's almost no change, like 0.2 microns per year. If you look at longitudinal studies, it'll be closer to about a half a micron per year. And if you look at studies that compare glaucoma patients to normals, glaucoma patients that are deemed stable typically change at about a micron per year. So we have kind of normals and stable glaucoma patients. Um, and this is just an example that in this study comparing uh, non-progressors and progressors, the average nerve fiber layer change uh, was 1.26 versus um, you know, less than one micron and so on. I'm gonna to get to a case. This is a case that was loaned to me from um, Drew Rickson at the VA hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. This is a patient that was an untreated ocular hypertension patient. He says, you're gonna to have to trust me. He didn't have glaucoma. Uh, this, they put him on a risk calculator. His risk was very low. So they were not treating him, but they were observing him. This was his initial RNFL in 2015 and his initial visual fields. Now over three visits, over three years, 
their interpretation of the OCT was all quadrants green. So first exam, all quadrants green. Second exam, OCT showing questionable progression in the right eye. You'll see that with those little red areas here. And then third visit, oh gosh, this patient has glaucoma. Now I would actually argue that you could see that in this first OCT, looking at the asymmetry between right and left eye, but I'm not here to judge their decision-making. We all, we all make the best decisions that we can on the day that we're seeing the patient. But let's look very carefully at this right eye. So these are just showing the numbers over about a, a, a five-year period of time. And if we look at the, at the trend analysis, you'll see that the slope of the average nerve fiber layer is about four microns per year. So remember that normal is probably somewhere between about a half and one micron per year. This guy's four times the change in that right eye. If you look at the infratemporal sector, it looks like he's kind of going along falls a little bit and then just dives off the deep end. And if you look at the left eye for comparison, and again, the word asymmetry is gonna come up, the slope of the RNFL here is a half a micron per year. So different between the right and left eye is different between the top and the bottom, and it's different in the way and the rate at which it progresses. So I use all of those things in trying to decide if a patient is changing. Now, when I was talking about green disease earlier, I was saying that you can make a number of changes within the green um, and you'll still just stay green, right? You could start at the 95th percentile and go down to the 75th percentile and down to the 50th percentile and even down to the 6th percentile and stay green. So please don't use your reds, yellows, and greens for deciding if a patient has changed over time. What is significant change? It really depends on the instrument and it depends on the variability. Um, but here are some numbers um, that that I have kind of clung on to, which is about two, two to two and a half microns per year of the average nerve fiber layer, it would be considered a, a highly significant rate of change. When you get into the sectors, there's more variability. So you're gonna have to allow for more change before you consider it uh, significant. So somewhere probably in the four micron uh, per year change in the sectors or clock hours. Now, just like if we had a visual field that looked like it was getting worse, uh, we would repeat it. We need to do the same thing with OCTs. And it's a, it kind of goes against what we think, right? Because we think about our OCTs as being these objective measurements, uh, but there is variability. So I wanna show you an example of a patient that uh, looked like on his third visit uh, that he had some yellow areas in, in his deviation map, deviation from baseline. He had some yellow areas flagged in his T-SNIT curve. He has some checks over here. Um, and so I said, all right, it looks like maybe he's changed. I'm going to verify. So I brought him back and those things, if they're real, are going to stay and the yellows are actually gonna to turn to red. And in fact, he went right back to where he was. There is no change. This is not progression. And if I had called it progression here and made a change in his therapy, I would likely be over treating this patient. There are a lot of reasons why I thought it wasn't real change. And one is that you don't typically see change superiorly and inferiorly at the same time. Another is because this purple is an indicator of thickening um, and we don't have thickening of nerve fiber layers. So I thought this was likely some kind of alignment issue. And we also see some pretty big motion artifacts in this scan. So these blood vessels come down and they jump over. Uh, and so there were a variety of reasons I didn't think that this was real change. And in fact, it wasn't. Now, when should you stop doing OCTs on RNFL OCTs on your patients? Probably about here. There is nothing here. The patient's reached a floor uh, somewhere in the low 50s is probably a point where you're not really going to get anything out of your RNFL OCT anymore. Uh, and then finally, the last thing I'll say, because I know I'm at, my, at the end of my time, once you have a patient who has been confirmed 
to change, and you've decided that that change is unacceptable, they're changing at a rate that's too fast, you want to modify their therapy, you need to reset your baselines in your OCT and your visual field. Because if we continue to compare to the old ones, we're going to continue to see that it looks like it's progressing. And so when we change our therapy, we reset our target pressure, we increase our therapy, we send them for surgery or a laser or MIGS, or we add medicine, we have to reset the timeline because now now what we want to know is from this point moving forward, are they continuing to change? And so this is a patient of mine. I'll just show you very quickly. You can see that there's obvious change, whether we're looking at event analysis or trend analysis, there's obvious change in his RNFL. Interestingly, though, while we made the diagnosis of glaucoma here, he didn't get on board with his therapy despite multiple attempts until this visit right here. Well, if I'm always comparing to these original scans, it's always going to tell me that he's progressing. So what I did was I went in and I made this, where he finally started using his medicine, my new baseline. And when I did that, I now have not very many visits, but I now have a much more stable RNFL. So you have you can't just change the baseline because you don't like the way it's going, um, but you you do need to reset the baseline uh, when you have made a significant change in your therapy. So in summary, you know. If you have access to an OCT, please use it. If you're not doing macular scans on your glaucoma and glaucoma suspect patients, please do. Uh, and just remember that your OCT is a powerful tool, but your brain is the biggest tool that you have in diagnosing and managing these patients. If you have any questions, you can email me. I'll also go into the chat right now, but um, that concludes my presentation for the evening. Great job, Danica. Thank you. There Danica, is a question in there. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I, I see some sound questions. Okay, so for the patients with RNFLs that are within normal limits for an individual eye, but asymmetry that falls outside of the guidelines between the two eyes, do I still start them on meds after your first evaluation? So this is a really good question and one that's a little hard to answer because there are a variety of reasons why a patient might be asymmetric. So for example, if their disc size is asymmetric, if their refractive error is asymmetric, if there's something that I can explain it, the, the asymmetry on, then I might not. But if it's a patient that I'm sort of pondering, and I do a lot of pondering, I don't, I don't love to make the diagnosis of glaucoma. I like to re be really sure before I, I make that call because it, it has a really significant impact on the patient. So if I'm sitting there thinking, you know, this really kind of looks like glaucoma, maybe there's a history in the family that intraocular pressure is a little elevated, the nerves are a little wonky, and I look at that and I see that asymmetry, that's going to be something that's probably going to push me over to the side of, yeah, this is likely glaucoma. Great. A couple things I'll echo while you're looking through the chat is that um, one, you, you know, you're near and dear to my heart, referencing all that symmetry. And I have on, if people want to learn more on the uh, OEC uh, YouTube, there's a red, yellow, physiologically normal. It all talks about symmetry, echoing everything that you said there. Lecturing in this, and you've said it, and I'm just going to echo it because I get it as questions all the time. The macula is looking at ganglion cells. Off the ganglion cell comes an axon, and the axon then runs into the nerve fiber layer. So when you're looking at the ganglion cell complex, doesn't matter which instrument and and uh, we're talking about, but that's the ganglion cell itself. And then the retinal nerve fiber layer is actually that axon that dies. You've said it, but I get so many questions with that. I just want to echo it. And then being a speaker within uh, OCT angiography, you know, OCT angiography is great in diabetes. It's really good in macular degeneration. And just like you said, it's fine in its way in glaucoma. It's just another structural piece of information that you can use to help with that progression analysis. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, some, when I when I was first reading about the use of OCTA in glaucoma, you know, looking at the peripapillary blood vessels, I was like, oh, please don't give me one more piece of information that I have to consider. You know, but but realistically, 
the more information we have, particularly if it all begins to mesh together, the stronger you can you know, feel that this patient actually has glaucoma. Any other questions in the chat box there that you guys are evaluating? I'm looking, uh, looks like no. Joe, can you see my screen where it says, thank you? Yes, yes. I can. All right. Well, Danica is, you know, no surprise, you did a great job here tonight and, you know, taking some, something from OCT that can be so complex with all the physiological changes that are out there and helping clarify that. So thank you. And thank you for doing maximizing the OCT and glaucoma. It's really my pleasure. Thanks for having me. We're, we love having you. And uh, I think that uh, you really added something to our series. So thank you so much. Thanks again. So that's going to conclude the CE part.